Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another session of the CSPC interview series. We are pleased to, uh, to have with us today uh, Gordon McCauley, President and CEO of Admir Bio Innovators, uh, which, as it says on its website, it is Canada's global life sciences venture, building the Canadian life sciences industry from C to C. Mr. McCauley has also been a senior executive of several successful healthcare enterprises, including President and CEO of Viable Healthcare uh, Health Work Corps, a national healthcare service business, President and CEO of Allen Therapeutics, a neuroscience biotechnology company, and co-founder and partner of NDI Capital, an institutionally backed life science investment fund. Mr. McCauley has been a director and board member of numerous uh, organizations, private and publicly traded companies, uh, including director of board member of Life Sciences British Columbia and served as its chair, Biotech Canada and chairman of the, and of the board of CGEN, Canada's national genomics enterprise. He has also been a senior advisor to several prominent Canadian political leaders. In 2008, Mr. McCauley was the first Canadian appointed to the Board of Biotechnology Industry Organization, or BIO, in Washington, D.C., where he served in leadership positions until 2013. Uh, welcome, Gord, uh, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Yeah, thank you, Mark. It's been delightful to be with you today. Yeah, and I believe that you're speaking with us from Vancouver. I am. I'm speaking to you from our, uh, our facility on the campus of uh, the University of British Columbia where our headquarters is. We also have a large facility in Montreal and it does all in the Techno Park that uh, serves as a host to uh, a variety of partners, 33 or 34 companies that are partners of ours in the ecosystem in Montreal. Excellent, glad to have you here with us. And so as uh, in the past, the format of the interview today is uh, that I will ask a few questions for about 15 mi minutes or so, and then uh, we'll open up the Q&A and uh, you can write your questions into the Q&A box and uh, feel free to, uh, to vote up a question if you like, and do not use the chat line for questions, only use the chat line if you have technical dif difficulties. And uh, so now to our interview, I want to ask you, Gord, could you provide uh, an overview of Admir's role in the Canadian life sciences ecosystem? Sure. So Admari plays a really critical role in the life sciences ecosystem in Canada by really doing three things. First of all, we seek to identify the most compelling research wherever we can find it, bring it together and do the necessary translational work to build companies of scale. Uh, our team is really good at that. We have, uh, as of this morning, helped create uh, nine companies. Uh, those companies today are worth two and a half billion dollars. They have raised over $700 million of real risk capital, and they employ more than 700 Canadians. So I'm really proud of the work that our team does in that respect. The second thing we do is help companies scale up. So we do this uh, really in three ways. We are a very active uh, seed investor in the space. Uh, we provide expertise to companies or we provide uh, infrastructure and space to companies or a combination of those three things. Uh, and again, uh, as, as I was saying at the, at the top, if you look at our innovation center in, uh, in Montreal, which is a tremendous success story, uh, it's home to uh, 34, 35 companies uh, of various sizes that uh, employ 300, 325 people and is really a, a jewel in the crown in the, uh, the ecosystem in, in Montreal and in, in Canada for that matter. And, and we do a similar sort of thing here. The third role that we play is, uh, is training. And we're really focused on what we consider to be the critical training pieces in uh, the Canadian ecosystem to build the next generation of the first one of those is our Executive Institute, which is uh, really a very exciting program that's essentially a 10-month working MBA for mid-career people clearly identified by their colleagues as a future C-suite uh, personnel. And, and that program happens over the course of 10 months. Uh, it meets five times, alternating between Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver, generally for three days each. And, and at the end of that process, what you have is, uh, as I say, essentially a working MBA. And, and that program 
uh, has been a tremendous success uh, based on significant sponsorship received from Pfizer Canada to, uh, to create it and really has set the bar uh, for what, what leadership training in this space looks like. One of the things I want to say quickly though, one of the things I'm really proud about of that program, not just a success obviously, but we decided at the outset that that program would be uh, equally balanced between women and men and would broadly reflect the, the diversity of Canada. And our team has done a really good job of that. In the first cohort, it was 50-50. The second cohort, which just graduated, uh, there were more women than men. Uh, and, and I'm pretty confident that in the, in the third cohort, which we're going to, uh, we're going to announce the, uh, the opening of applications in the next uh, short period of time, I, I think you'll see that again. The other part of our, of our training enterprise is focused on helping scientists become more commercially minded. We, we have spectacular uh, academic training uh, in Canada that helps build highly qualified scientists. One of the things we try and do is, is help those scientists understand the commercial mindset and commercial research, which is of course a, 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 different, uh, a different process based on the same fundamentals. And, and, and I'm, I got to say that program, which we've recently expanded quite dramatically as the, the bioinnovation scientist program, has been an incredible success. 96% of the people that uh, graduate from that program have gone on to relevant jobs in industry. So, so we're very excited about that. So that's what we try and do. We try and build companies to scale. We try and help companies scale up. And we try and make sure that the personnel that they need for their uh, success are available. Very good to hear that, Gordon. As you, uh, we know that the building uh, the leaders of the next generation, uh, leaders of science policy is one of the pillars of CSPC. So I'm I'm very pleased to hear that that you know the building the leaders of life science industry is that uh, you are contributing to that. That's excellent. So just as a side note, your picture again is dark enough sometimes. If you could make sure that high quality option is I, on. I did on actually our check while we were. Just while you were doing the intro, I'll double check again now. But it, thank you. It says thank it's you. there. It's there. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So that's good. So I'll go uh, to this, the next this question. This is as good as I look, Meredith. What can I tell you? <laughs> no, thank you. That's very enough. We're good. Um, so uh, I want to ask you now uh, the COVID pandemic. A uh, lot of things have changed. I just want to ask you how COVID changed the life science ecosystem. Uh, I think there are a handful of uh, changes that we've seen. I think there are a handful of changes that are that are coming that we can perhaps anticipate, but obviously we're not going to know until until they're here. I mean, certainly one of the things we saw is the fundamental strength of the collaborative spirit of science in general. Uh, I would say science in Canada, and and there's something about an industry and an ecosystem where the where the primary objective is helping people, there is just, a, there is just an innate uh, collaborative uh, and nature and kindness kind of nature that comes together. And we've seen that among scientists, among business people, among uh, venture capitalists. The other thing that, that I think the pandemic has showed us about the Canadian ecosystem in particular is its profound robustness. Uh, in the first early days of the pandemic, our colleagues uh, looked at the ecosystem and, and scientists are very good at pivoting quickly and saying, okay, uh, this is a serious problem. What, what should we be doing in our lab, wherever it is in the country? And I'm gonna say after a few weeks, uh, our colleagues were able to identify 20 vaccine programs, 30 therapeutic programs, uh, 20 biomanufacturing programs, 40 uh, diagnostic programs and another 30 or 40 kind of tool support programs. And, and to be clear, Meredith, I'm not talking about, you know, the really capable grant writers we know that take their hair growth product and make it relevant for COVID. I'm talking about programs that our colleagues looked at and, and were able to validate on, on an initial review as being viable with real potential of, of making an impact. So, so uh, first of all, it showed us the robustness of this industry, which of course you've known for years. All of us uh, have, have seen that robustness for years. The other thing that it taught us, I think pretty quickly, is uh, the adaptability of the ecosystem. I mean, Darwin taught us that it is the adaptable that survive. And to see people 
uh, repurpose really high quality research uh, into areas of uh, critical concern around COVID so right. far has been, I, I think, profoundly encouraged. The other thing I'll say that I think is, is fascinating as well is on the business side, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we were uh, delighted to announce this morning uh, the creation of a new company in partnership with Amercam in Montreal based on really exciting work of uh, Dr. Philippe Segala at uh, the Montreal Neurological Institute. And we're very excited about this, about this uh, new company. And obviously that discussion has been going on for some time. And three months ago, when the pandemic struck, the scientists involved, the institutions involved, and the business people involved, didn't just say, okay, we'll have to wait. Nah, people kind of sat back and said, okay, this is a, a different environment, how do, how do we do it? And I think it's a real testament to the capacity in the ecosystem to, uh, to do those things. So that's, those are some of the things we've seen. Uh, I think there are hints right now of other pretty profound impacts that we're going to see over the next uh, short period of time. The first is, is all of us have been talking for some time about the fusion of disciplines, whether it's scientific disciplines within life sciences or the disciplines of life, uh, the fusion of life sciences and IT and diagnostics. I think that, that is unquestionably a trend that has been underway for some time. I think the pandemic has served as a bit of a catalyst for that to happen very quickly. And one simple example is a, is a collaboration we had with a really interesting company called Variational AI, which uh, has been a dialogue we've had probably for a year and change. We had a small project going, uh, but in collaboration with the digital supercluster and Variational, we were able to significantly advance that very quickly because people said, we, we, we need to move. So I think that that is, uh, is a, a, a compelling impact of, uh, of the pandemic. The third thing I'd say is that uh, there's a lot of discussion about domestic supply and the security of domestic supply, which is absolutely critical, particularly around vaccines, obviously. But I think when you start to think about the practical implications of domestic supply, it leads you pretty quickly to manufacturing. And I think it's probably unrealistic to say that uh, even a pandemic would have a dramatic impact on global supply chains around small molecules, for example. However, uh, in some of the areas where Canada has real uh, scientific and business strength in uh, precision therapies, in cell therapies, in biologics, uh, it's entirely rational to look at those things and say, at those areas and say, you know, we should, we should make sure that the manufacturing is part of the whole dialogue. So it's not just the drug development right. or the product right. development process, it's manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the changes that, that, that I think are, are coming down the pike, Meredith. And, and I think, um, you know, again, from a, from a Canadian perspective, I think they're very encouraging signs for us, if I may say that in the midst of the so very positive and compelling message out of a tragedy. Uh, Gord, uh, glad to hear that. But let me ask you as a follow up on that note, you mentioned uh, vaccines and drugs. Uh, there are so many discussions about drugs or vaccines for COVID-19. Tell us in your opinion, somebody who knows the industry well, uh, what are the possibilities and likelihood of having a vaccine or medication for COVID uh, in near future? Um, well, let's be clear. I'm I, I'm not a scientist, so I I don't want to advertise myself as as being anything more than a than a somewhat uh, informed observer. Uh, I think it is fair to say that, given the extent globally of the effort to focus on finding a vaccine and the capacity uh, of uh, vaccine development, I think there's a certainly a reasonable chance and a reasonable timeline. Uh, I fear that some of the expectations being created by uh, some leaders globally about the speed with which we'll see a vaccine uh, are misplaced. I, I think it's going to take the same amount of time it usually does, uh, particularly for a, for a virus that is um, quite pernicious and where we're only really beginning to understand uh, some of the effects. And I think within Canada, again, I think there are a, a small handful of really interesting, either uh, 
pure vaccine products that I think have some real potential or uh, companies providing uh, uh, expertise and support to that process that will, uh, will advance it kind of, kind of quickly. Great. I have, yeah, sorry, no, go no, ahead. No, you, you, you go ahead. You go ahead. So I have more questions, but I want to ask this uh, question first and then open it up for a question from the audience. Uh, I want to ask you, what has the pandemic taught us about Canada's public policy versus life sciences or innovation more broadly, if you will, and what the strengths and weaknesses of the sector has it shown a spotlight on? And how can government best respond to this, in your opinion? Um, so I think, first of all, um, the pandemic has clearly taught us that the life science industry in this country, the life science uh, scientific expertise in this country, the basic research infrastructure in this country is absolutely uh, world class and absolutely critical to the future of a healthy society in all of the senses of the word uh, healthy. Uh, I think it has also taught us that uh, there will be fundamental changes to our economy going forward. I mean, you, you only need to walk down the street in your neighborhood and see profound impacts and start to think through how some of those changes happen. And if you translate that sort of micro example to a, to a broad macro um, economy kind of situation, I think, I think we're going to see industries disappear. And so we find ourselves in the middle of uh, an area that is critical to the future of uh, Canadians' health, but also has the potential to be critical, a foundational piece to the future economy of Canada. If you think about the research infrastructure we have in Canada, it's well established that we punch well above our relative weight in uh, the innovation output from that research infrastructure. It's incredible. At 0.5% of the global population, we're responsible for 5% of the innovative output. So we, we know we have that and we have uh, an emerging industry that is uh, seeking to, to translate that into a sustainable life sciences industry in the country. And I think all of the signs are very encouraging about that. I think we've seen the development of very exciting companies. I think we've seen the development of uh, the, the emerging development of a sustainable life uh, venture capital uh, ecosystem to, to support it and all of the all of the relevant pieces of that. that said uh, i think we need to make a def demonstrative decision from a public policy perspective that this is an industry we care about not just because of the human health obviously that's great right, right. but because from an economic policy perspective that's right. this is an industry that's going to have a dramatic impact and 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 look the, the uh, governments across the country Federal government, absolutely, uh, uh, governments across the country at the provincial level have, have often uh, supported this industry, have made capital available. They're a significant uh, reason that we exist and a major funder of, of our activities. But I think there's a lot more that can be done. And right. so I think, we, I think we have to focus on maintaining that research leadership role. That's absolutely critical. That is the, the fundamental piece. Without it, this industry doesn't exist. I think we have to focus on the uh, translational capacity of organizations like Admari or like Iracor or like CCRM in, in, in Toronto. I think we have to focus on the um, uh, capacity of building the venture capital industry. As I say, it's, it, it's growing in this space. But look, in the early days of the pandemic, two and a half billion US dollars were added to funds in the United States in life sciences alone, which tells you other people, capitalists around the world are seeing the potential of, of life sciences and, and, and we're developing that industry in Canada and there are strong venture capital groups here, but we need them to be stronger because we need that venture capital success to stay within Canada. We need the economic spoils, if you will, to stay within Canada. And then finally, uh, Obviously, that, that training piece that, that we spend a lot of time on is, is also critical to make sure that we have those people. So, look, we're in, a, we're in a terrific spot. I think there's a lot of potential to do more. And I think that there's a real opportunity for public policymakers across the country to really say this is one of the key foundational industries because 
that's what the data say. And at the end of the day, Meridad, we're all driven by science and we're all driven by data. So it, it's it's a pretty exciting spot. So it's in the end, on the public policy uh, point, I think uh, organizations such as CSBC are one of the venues, you know, to form this discussions and, and inclusive discussions and move it forward and bring it to the attention of the community at large. Okay, thank you, Gord, for this uh, excellent response. Now I want to uh, give the opportunity to participants to ask questions. We go to the questions. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask and write your questions and feel free to vote up a question if you like. Meantime, my colleagues at CSBC office will share one question about which sector you belong to. These surveys help us to uh, plan for the future uh, programs uh, that we have. Uh, please kindly provide us with an answer about this. And uh, if you have any question, uh, we are all listen, uh, listening to this and I can read uh, the questions uh, for Gord. And while we are waiting for the question, Gord, I want to ask you one la maybe last question for this part. How can we balance the domestic supply of medical products with our role as versus global leaders, global innovators, and global citizens, right? Um, so one of the, this is, this is a monstrous um, public policy onion, if you will. There are many, many layers as we... As and there were some discussions in the mainstream media regarding the masks and others, you know, so we all hearing that in the past couple of months anyway. Yeah, and, and I think the, the, uh, the, the multilateralism that has been a foundational piece of our uh, public discourse in the Western world for the last um, 75, 80 years is, is under fairly serious threat. So I think you see it at a, at a global kind of macro political scale. And I think we, we certainly see it within, within the industry. So I think there are a couple of things that, that we need to be conscious of. The first is that uh, if ever one went looking for an industry that is truly global, that truly doesn't understand borders, uh, it's life sciences. I, I am pretty sure, uh, I'm quite sure, I could not identify a single program that we're involved with, a single company that we're involved with, that was not seriously influenced, even at a basic science level, by work that was done elsewhere globally, or is even uh, influenced continually along the way by those, by those developments. So I think it's critically important for us as an industry to think about how we maintain those um, scientific alliances globally and how they work. And, and I think um, you folks at, at CSBC do a terrific job within Canada. And I think one of the exciting, uh, one of the exciting opportunities of a virtual kind of format that you and I were talking about earlier is the capacity to bring in others from around the world into the dialogue because that we make a mistake if we restrict our dialogue domestically. Um, I think it's going to require us uh, when you go down the development path to think about which things can we really um, make sure are developed domestically and are manufactured domestically and which are which are done globally but at the end of the day i think we make a, a, a fundamental mistake if we say to each other in the world that domestic supply of product is is the critical issue because that's not the issue domestic supply of knowledge of expertise is the critical issue. That's why we're in such a good spot as, as uh, a life sciences community in Canada and why we've been able to respond so quickly to the pandemic. So I, I, I just, I don't want to lose sight of the, the, the critical importance of that knowledge and expertise because there are some uh, political squabbles around uh, supply of product. It's not, it's not a de minimis issue by any means. I'm not suggesting that, but knowledge is the critical piece. Excellent. Uh, so there is a question by Jeff Kinder. Uh, do you see federal uh, procurement as an important policy tool for your sector and how could it be improved in your opinion? So I think um, absolutely procurement is an important component. Uh, it's easier to understand candidly in the more a physical product part of the industry where you think about diagnostics or you think about um, uh, devices and so on, a little bit less so around, uh, around drugs specifically.
But absolutely, if you look at the work that the Health and Biosciences Economic Strategy Table did a couple of years ago, they had some very innovative ideas about the capacity of uh, government at any level, whether it's federal or in, in some respects, uh, from a pure procurement perspective, uh, just as relevant at a provincial level to using uh, procurement sandboxes to test out ideas, to right. give um, not necessarily preferred access, but but beta test access to different uh, different products that they develop. So I think I think that is a critical part of the uh, of the process. Absolutely. Okay. And a question by Youssef Al Shatfan. I hope I pronounced the name uh, correctly. What are the biggest challenges that companies face economically to stay in Canada? Uh, this is a more uh, general question. Why do you, why do they leave Canada and go to other countries? And how can we keep the, these companies in Canada and help them grow? That's like a simple, simple question. <laughs> um, That's a one million dollar question. <laughs> it's, 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 it, look, all facetiousness aside, it's absolutely a fundamental question. At a, at our core, it's why we exist to help build and grow companies. In I think there are a lot of historical reasons why we got to the spot where uh, most companies in Canada thought about developing a product to um, uh, human proof of concept uh, in exceptional cases to the marketplace be before they were sold. Uh, I think that that was a result of um, some economic forces around globalization that happened in the early 2000s, and I think it was exacerbated by the economic crisis in, in 2008, 9, 10. And for those of us that lived through it, uh, we know that um, survival was uh, a critical question almost every day. So it's perfectly understandable why why companies found um, found any route they could to uh, to some sort of uh, crystallization of a game. I don't think that there is a magic bullet to. Um, uh, there's not a magic pu public policy book that, that, that can be used to say, I want, I, I'm going to force this company to stay. I think there are some creative things. I think there are some opportunities for um, public funds to be invested in companies with differential return feedbacks or, or repayments rather um, if a company leaves uh, and, and there's some penalty if the, if the company leaves. And I think those are interesting ideas that we ought to pursue. I think more importantly, the way you build a successful cluster in Canada is by, by building on the fundamentals and continuing to grow them. And, and it's, it's kind of a frustrating answer for public policymakers, frankly, that, that there's, there's, there's actually no lever that you can pull to do it except to do more, right? The, the way you get companies to stay is by building more companies because at its core, I think it's an aspirational question. I think it's a question of, of the leadership of companies saying, this is what we want to do. We want to build a company that's going to be a cornerstone company in Canada. And so I think that aspiration is critically important. Frankly, I think it's smart because for people who lead companies, um, I always say that optionality is your friend. Having multiple options at every decision point or milestone is always preferable to only having one. Uh, that's, that's I, I hope, self-evident to people. But again, it, it, it comes back to the same sort of things that we're talking about, Mary. It, it comes back to uh, building companies of scale that have uh, multiple shows on goal, that have broad scientific uh, platforms, that have done the scientific work to a global depth. Um, you know, they, they, they didn't do, um, uh, one animal study, they did five. They didn't do uh, 20 animals, they did 40. Those kinds of things, I'm, I'm being simplistic, obviously, but really interrogating the science as deeply and aggressively as you can. I think it comes to how you help those companies scale up and making the expertise and capital available to those companies. And then it comes back to um, the, the training of, the, of, those, of those future leaders. I mean, again, having those kind of anchor companies is a critical component to to the training cycle as well and we're actively trying to fill the gap created by the absence of anchor companies um, in, in in training those those people but i really believe it comes back to those three issues really 
And uh, on, as a follow-up, a question posted by Jeff Kinder about the intellectual property. Uh, do you think that uh, we, our uh, intellectual property regime in Canada uh, is optimized for your sector? Um, optimized is a, is, a, is a tough word because by definition, <laughs> the answer is never going to be yes. Um, I think that as an objective, we have to be globally competitive with intellectual property. We have to make sure that the opportunity to, uh, to uh, develop that intellectual property for the benefit of, of patients is possible within Canada on a, on a par with uh, the most advanced countries. And uh, certainly the, the, the value equation is broader than that, but we have to make sure that we are constantly evaluating uh, IP standards and making sure that, that, uh, that we're up to that. Obviously, I, I think inherently in that answer is, is the sense that there's more that we, that we can do. Uh, it's sometimes a tough issue for public policymakers because there are differing uh, competing uh, uh, challenges and, 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 and debates there. Certainly, the open science movement, I think, is very exciting for the development of knowledge and the development of science. Um, I think there are a limited number of examples where open science throughout the development process has led to uh, a real product. I think uh, something developed in the open science environment, again, I think really exciting and really helpful. I think ultimately it requires intellectual property in most cases to be, uh, to be developed uh, from an industrial perspective. Okay, so there are two more questions. There are more, but let's answer these two questions and then we end our program. But uh, before that, I want to ask my colleagues at CSBC, please launch the question about the, our performance with this session and please rank our session. And again, your opinion helps us to improve and to get better. Uh, but uh, there is a question by uh, David Hall, uh, asking federal and provincial government funding for science uh, research, including science policy, does not compare well uh, with the level of uh, the OECD countries. And uh, so it, is it a better model to expect industry to pick up the tab or should we pressure government to do more? And the questionnaire, by the way, sir, uh, uh, it's launched. Please answer to that question, the participants. Gord, over to you. Uh, I, I think the answer to the question is is probably yes on, on all fronts. I mean, um, certainly we can do more in terms of the um, in terms of the support we provide to basic research. I think we have to acknowledge that uh, successive governments over the course of the last uh, twenty years really have have made, if not more, have made substantive investments in basic research, and there is always more that we that we can and should be doing. One of the interesting uh, elements I know, however, it, it's been a long discussion within Canada about uh, the private sector innovation investments and research investments have, have been lagging for some time. And I, and I think it's probably not true within, within life sciences, although we don't have hard data to validate that statement. It's certainly true on a broader basis. One of the things that's interesting to me, however, is that uh, Canadian companies that become multinationals are 25% more innovative and more productive than uh, their peers uh, within the Canadian uh, economy. I think that's a really exciting uh, goal for, for this ecosystem to say, you know what, if we continue to succeed at building anchor companies, and, and again, there are a bunch of examples uh, across the country, uh, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, have companies that are really uh, emerging as a future cadre of, of anchors. If we're successful at doing that, the data tell us that those companies are more likely to be even more innovative. So I think it's a bit of a marriage between the public investment in basic research and the capacity of uh, industry to really advance that economically. And it's, you can't really successfully have one without the other. Okay, that's good. Uh, well, there are two, uh, these are the two last questions, are more or less uh, aligned with each other. I just touched on both. Uh, one question is uh, saying, why not have a private equity company in Canada that could be a crown corporation and uh, treat uh, the healthcare sector as we do the oil and gas sector? And the other question, similar to this, 
is reference to, uh, let me just, if I get it right, right? Okay, so uh, th there needs to be more mid-stage capital to advance the companies to financing and uh, financing and sustainability of the life sciences sector. What is your response to these two questions? Or so, you know, I, I, again, I think I start from the perspective that we absolutely need more uh, investment capital at each stage. I mean, we're a pretty aggressive a seed investor, as is Amerchem and Montreal, for example. Um, I, I think that uh, we need more capital at that stage, without question. We need the scale capital, that sort of mid-stage of, of how you get a company through um, uh, Series ABC. Uh, I think we need the, the uh, serious um, institutional pension fund kind of capital to pay attention to the space as well. So, so absolutely, the data are unquestionably clear. We need more right. capital in this, in this space. I, I guess the, the idea of a crown corporation, I guess my sense, uh, to be quite candid, I haven't thought a lot about that sort of model. My sense is that some of those tools exist um, with uh, existing Canadian uh, capital groups like uh, BDC, for example. And I think it is uh, more likely to be successful uh, by helping grow uh, the existing venture capital community in Canada and, it, and it's helping them focus in different areas. I'm pretty sure if you look at the data from uh, the last two uh, federal government programs that were focused on building that venture capital capacity, you would discover that the impact on the venture capital industry and on the life science industry and the companies that were created has been quite dramatic. So I think, I think we've got pretty good experience to say that focusing there works. And if we ultimately want to have a vibrant and sustainable uh, ecosystem, building that private venture capital capacity is absolutely critical. Because again, we need those returns to happen within Canada. Thank you very much, Gord. That brings us to the end of the interview. And I uh, just want to remind people that our next session will be a panel about Can COVID Project on June 10th at noon Eastern Time under the title of Building National Networks to Solve Wicked Problems. And they discuss uh, the lessons learned from Can COVID Experiment. And uh, the link to the sessions is uh, posted on our chat line. Please uh, take a look to see what's coming up and you can uh, explore the past sessions and listen to them. Also note that the panel submission the deadline for science policy conference is June 12th, uh, approaching fast. And again, link to the panel submission is posted on the chat line. And if you wish to tell us your ideas about how we can do better, you have more ideas, a survey monkey question will be pop up after this. And please, uh, if you don't mind, take that question. And I want to thank Gord for being with us. That was a very stimulating discussion. I really enjoyed that. And the last word goes to you, Gord. Uh, let, me, let me just say thank you very much, uh, Meredith and, and, and colleagues. Uh, I think the, the most important thing that we can do is continue the dialogue and continue the vibrance, vibrancy of this ecosystem. So I thank you for the role that you play and for everybody for participating in the dialogue. It's critically important. Thank you and look forward to have you in the future sessions as well as the annual conference. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Au revoir. And uh, thank you, everyone. Have a good day.